If you follow the news closely, the current president of Syria, that's right, the president for the country of Syria, actually recently paid a short visit to China. Again, given the fact that today that China today has long been considered as one of the largest economies in the world, in addition to the presence of U.S. But meanwhile, previously that would be discussing the nation of Syria. Given the fact today this nation's economic situation is facing a major deadlock and should we say even in turmoil. But meanwhile. By visiting China, the two countries actually sat down again among the leaders and signed what we called the strategic partnership. What does that mean, by the way? And also, when we talk about this international relationship, the mutual word or the key word we're looking at today is what we called reciprocity. So that's why I'm saying by helping Syria, Syria, what will China gain in return? Well, in this episode, we're going to talk about all of them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is the Dr. Christian Elrikson. Again, Dr. Elrikson is the fellow for the Middle East at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, and his research spans on history, political and international political economy, and international relations of the Gulf states and their changing position within the global order. Well, Dr. Elrikson, and welcome back. To the missing piece. Thanks for having me back, Dr. Elrikson. As we mentioned before, China rolled out the red carpet and welcomed the Syrian President、um, Al Bashar、uh, Assad. Now, help us with better understanding,、um, Professor. How important was it for Assad to visit China, and also how should we understand the phrase? Is what we called strategic partnership between the two countries. Well, as you know, Syria has been. Going through a civil war since 2011,、mm. when large parts of the country erupted in opposition to Assad and his government,、mm. and over time the Assad government has managed to regain control over parts, not all, but parts of Syria. And over the last couple of years, he has gradually been rehabilitated in terms of being. Reintegrated into the regional community, he attended the Arab League summit,、mm. which took place in Saudi Arabia in May this year. And if you remember, after 2011, Assad was more or less、uh, ostracized by the international community for committing、uh, you know, these crimes of aggression against his own people.、Mm. But over the last couple of years, that, that ostracism has begun to really drift away. And so, having succeeded in rehabilitating himself regionally, this visit, I think, was very important to Assad for the international symbolism it signified, where he was now being welcomed, as you say, in one of the biggest economies of the world. Until now, his only visit outside the Middle East over since 2011 had been to Russia,、mm. and Russia, of course, had intervened in 2015. In the Syrian civil war, to put boots on the ground, which really enabled Assad to turn the tide against the the forces that he faced. So this is a symbolic visit, breaking out of his international isolation,、uh, extending his rehabilitation from the regional stage to some extent internationally. The fact that it was China which welcomed him, obviously the occasion was for the Asian Games, but it was extremely.、Uh, I think a visit the Syrians were extremely keen to make for、mm. for what it signified. Now, in terms of the strategic partnership, I mean this was what was、uh, announced. I think it's too early to say whether it will be something substantive.、Mm. Obviously, the Syrian economy is still、uh, devastated by twelve years of war.、Mm. Uh, Assad doesn't even have full control over parts of the of the entire Syrian territory. There's going to be, or there's going to have to be, an awful lot of reconstruction that takes place in Syria first.、Mm. But if we're thinking long term, and the Chinese leadership does think long term, twenty, twenty-five years down the line, that might be a time horizon that、uh, is being looked at here in terms of、uh, the access to the Mediterranean, in terms of Syria's port at Latakia. We've obviously seen、uh, the, uh, the, we've seen recently the, the Middle East corridor, which.、Uh, India, Saudi Arabia, 
UAE and Israel have announced. This could be sort of giving Chinese a sort of different access to the Mediterranean because that one doesn't include China, it includes Israel. So there's maybe longer term projects that could be developed, but I think in the short term, at least, the focus will have to be on reconstruction in Syria and whether or not any Chinese companies would want to get involved in such politically delicate and, uh, quite frankly, potentially insecure operations. So we'll have to be, we'll have to wait and see. Mm. Dr. Elrickson, again, as I mentioned in the intro today, in addition to political interest, I think when we talk about China, it's more centers on the word economy. And of course, today we're living in the world that the word reciprocity tops the agenda. By helping Syria, again, this is the question that we asked before. As you mentioned, this country, politically speaking, is in turmoil. But meanwhile, Chinese economy is also standing at the crossroads and people are also questioning that if the current Chinese leader is actually directing the nation economically speaking on this positive or continuation journey. But meanwhile, what is China expecting? Or should we say, what can China expect by supporting um, Syria? If I'm not mistaken, again, Dr. Elrickson, you're the expert, Back in 2022 or 2020, the Syria actually joined this uh, significant major project. It's called Belt and Road Initiative. So what do you think that China is actually look forward to having Syria on the side in return? But particularly, we're looking at this economic joint venture. What do you think of that? Well, as you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is a major Chinese area of focus. Mm. They have a lot of uh, partners in the Middle East who are signed up to it, including U.S. partners in the Gulf, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE. And it could be that by including Syria in this initiative, as they have done over the last several years, again, the Chinese are maybe thinking, looking long term and thinking about how to include projects linking China, the Gulf, and the Mediterranean, in the sense that mm. China is creating these networks and pathways of economic uh, and investment uh, cooperation. Now, in terms of where Syria fits in, I think it will be something that will become apparent later this decade into the next decade, not necessarily right now. But another thing that the Chinese leadership will get out of this will be another demonstration that they are getting more involved in the Middle East. We've seen obviously in March this year how China brokered the uh, deal to restore diplomatic relations between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Mm. Uh, the Chinese also recently uh, received the uh, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, in, in, in China, I think in June. And uh, there were suggestions there that China could at some point become involved in uh, uh, negotiations for other Middle Eastern disputes like the Palestinian issue, or in this case, uh, Syria's regional issues. Now, that may or may not happen, but it certainly signifies, I think, that China has become much more visible, mm. much more visibly involved. And at a time when leaders in the Middle East are all expressing varying degrees of skepticism about whether the US is going to be a reliable long-term partner, and so there's a perception, if not necessarily a reality, there's a perception that the U.S. is somehow less interested in the Middle East and is disengaging or withdrawing. And that perception is real. That is, is there. And if uh, China is willing to step in and fill some of that vacuum, I think certainly that's something that uh, might be at play, again, over the longer term that we see beginning now in 2023, and maybe becoming more pronounced, uh, especially the further we go on with potentially U.S. Uh, you know, political uh, focus being shifted elsewhere. Mm. Dr. Elrickson, when we look at this relationship between, um, again, not just between China and Syria, but among any other type of relationship, I think three words, again, you're the experts as a political scientist that we tend to talk about, um, I guess, this criteria by using three words. Number one is competition. Number two is cooperation. And the last one is conditionality. 
I think it's much easier to understand the competition among the competitors, and also it's understandable that cooperation could enhance the mutual interest. Now, for China, for Syria, again, for China's interest among the nations in the Middle East, conditionality is rather tricky today. Now, let's go back to the nation of Syria. How much do you think that by visiting China or by strengthening the relationship with China, it actually elevated the international status for Assad at this moment? And also, how much do you think Assad can truly understand that China is supporting Syria, but based on the concept of conditionality. So in other words, no one is playing the game fairly, if I can be honest. But meanwhile, if you love to join the game, you have to understand the rules are not made, not by the Syrian government, but the rules are made by the Chinese perspectives. What do you think of that? Well, yes, I think the Syrians will have to understand, of course, that they are going to engage on terms that are not theirs to set. And I think there's I mean, any comparison between Syria and China will make it very clear that the uh, that the balance of interest is on China's side, mm. and the Chinese, uh, to some extent, can uh, set the terms and the conditions for for what uh, that engagement may take. And it will be interesting to see what those conditions are, and if they include uh, conditions on you know, related to Assad's uh, relationship with his own people. Because obviously, if you are going to try to engage economically, you need a secure and stable country in which to do so. And to try to ensure security and stability, you're going to have to make political compromises, at mm. least in, in terms of mm. trying to address so many of the outstanding issues that Syria continues to face. And so I think it will be interesting to see what that conditionality looks like, whether it's any different from conditions imposed by the US or the West in recent years, which actually still do not want to engage with Assad and uh, you know, threaten sanctions against companies that do engage with the Assad regime. Mm. And so is engaging with conditions going to be any more productive than refusing to engage and threatening those that do? I think that would be something to, to see and that might become apparent over medium term in you know, the next five years. I think it's definitely something to look to. And obviously for Syria, what it gets is it, it really undermines the international attempts to isolate Syria, to try to ensure that the uh, Assad regime is still uh, sort of persona non grata on the international stage. I mean, the US still maintains the, the Caesar, Caesar Act sanctions against Syria. But obviously, now having been uh, received in Beijing, it's just very much a message that actually parts of the parts of the rest of the world simply don't uh, don't buy these uh, these arguments. You, you know, the web the best way to deal with Syria is to isolate it. You have to engage with it. So I think it will be interesting as well to see whether Assad now follows up by going to other parts of the world, to other areas. Does he start becoming more visible? internationally going to other parts, maybe the global south, mm. again, do not necessarily buy into this, uh, you know, sort of Western led uh, isolation. I think that might be something to look for as well. Mm. Now, again, let's continue our conversation. Now, some experts believe that by visiting China, again, from the Syrian's perspective, that China might again use the role as the facilitator. Now, when we look at the role of facilitator, we're looking at the relationship among Syria, Turkey, Iran, and Russia. So in other words, those key players today are also paying attention to what's happening in Syria and also what's happening to Assad's regime. Now, Dr. Al Rickson, help us with better understanding. How much do you think that China today is interested in being the mediator? Again, we're looking at Syria, we're looking at Iran, and make no mistake, Iran also showed a much greater interest in China, and also the head of the Iranian government visit China this year, again, again, not too long ago as well. So by gaining the confidence and by being the facilitator, what we call the mediator, whatever the name is, 
How much do you think that China is willing to play the card on the table for Syria, for Turkey, for Iran, and also for Russia? But on the other hand, we have to understand the war in Ukraine today has not ended at all. So in other words, how do you think that China can balance that with Syria, with Turkey, Iran, with all the key players sitting on the side? What do you think of that? Well, it is a very difficult balancing act, and mm. uh, it's going to be hard for any leader or country to try and align all those different sets of interests. I mean, obviously, Syria has a long, deep relationship with Iran, has obviously a long and deep relationship with Russia as well. And Turkey and Syria have a, a long history of uh, unresolved border issues as well. So there's a whole host of uh, challenges, which is also why when the Syrian uprising began, it, it regionalized and became international so quickly because there were so many regional actors which felt they had an interest and they got involved. I mean, it wasn't a, a dispute that was kept in-house. It very quickly uh, assumed regional dimensions. And I think that illustrates the number of outside parties that continue to have a very close interest in mm. what happens in Syria now and going forward and so for a country like china to step in to to try to uh, establish a sense of uh, direction i think is certainly going to be a challenge now one could say that if a country that if there's a country that can do it it could potentially be a country like china partly because they do maintain relationships with all the parties involved and we saw this with iran and saudi arabia the chinese were able to bring that deal over the line even though most of the legwork had been done previously by Iraq and Oman, but the Chinese were able to facilitate and deliver a deal, which has actually worked in a way that, for example, the U.S. could not have done just because mm. the U.S. does not have diplomatic relations with Iran. So the U.S. could not have done this. The Chinese could, and they did. And so far, six months later, it has actually delivered. Iran and Saudi Arabia have restored diplomatic relations. They've taken steps to begin to rebuild uh, bilateral ties and visits in both directions. So it could be that with maintaining relationships with Russia, with Iran, with uh, Turkey, obviously with Syria, the, the Chinese could try to at least insert themselves into that dynamic too. And again, this is a challenge. There are so many different interests. It's probably more complex than Saudi Arabia and Iran just because there, there were only two parties which both wanted to, I think, find an agreement for different reasons, but they were both there was a willingness on both sides to to reach a reach a deal mm. with Syria because there were so many different parties, to say nothing of all the non state rebel groups and opposition forces. Mm. There were so many different parties and agendas at play that it might be more more difficult to to do that. But of course a country like China which does have those relationships at the highest level can probably do more than, say, the U.S. could. With, you know, the U.S. doesn't deal with the Assad regime. And the U.S. doesn't deal with Iran. So already there you're missing half the equation. And, and with Russia, of course, too. Now, let's bring U.S. into our conversation, Dr. Elrickson. How much do you think that it could influence the perspective from the West side? Because, again, you know, on one hand, the experts believe that sanctions don't work. I mean, again, we've seen that you, I mean, U.S. has been very active in placing sanctions, you know, on countries of Russia, on Syria. I mean, again, many more. But so far, needless to say, that sanctions seem it's become less meaningful or less engaging for countries as Syria as Russia. But on the other hand, we also need to understand that by manipulating the Assad regime or by understanding the Assad regime can also be contributive to the growth of U.S. and also the international status of U.S. But this time, the media was watching. Again, um, Assad was in China and both leaders shook hands. And of course, they had a great dialogue, etc., how much do you think could actually impla uh, impact the role of the U.S., especially when we're looking at the foreign policy from the U.S. perspective towards Middle East? Because, again, some argues that U.S. today is standing at the crossroads with the nations in the Middle East. One step, for, uh, again, closer, we could gain much ground. But again, one step closer, we could also lose 
the ground as well. So what do you think of that, Professor? Well, I think, first of all, we have to realize the U.S. is coming up to an election in 2024, mm. just over a year from now. And so domestic policy, I think, will increasingly take center stage in terms of the focus of what the U.S. officials are doing, especially given such a contested electoral process this time around. Mm. I think also in terms of U.S. Middle East policy, the U.S. seems to have really focused heavily on trying to achieve a Saudi-Israel uh, mm. normalization agreement. Uh, this seems to have become the main emphasis of U.S. Middle East policy and is likely to remain so at least until the end of this current administration's term. Whether mm. or not it has a second term, is, you know, we'll wait and see. But I certainly I think for the next year, a U.S.-Saudi-Israel focus is going to be uppermost. And where that leaves the rest of the Middle East, I think, is is another matter. And I think I don't see the U.S. shifting policy on Syria anytime soon, regardless of whether one thinks uh, you know, sanctions are, are, are not working. And of course, as, as countries like China engage with Iran, um, with, sorry, with Syria and Iran, I think we, we're seeing clearly that you know, the countries are not willing to respect those sanctions and are willing to take actions which you know, deliver other results. And so if China leads, I think it would be interesting to see how many other countries follow. And we've already seen Saudi Arabia, the UAE, both very closely part of the US-led network of partners in the Gulf. But we've been we've seen both of those countries really engaging with Syria, despite the US telling them not to. Mm. And we've seen Assad visit Dubai and Abu Dhabi in 2022. He was in Saudi Arabia for the Arab League summit in, July, in May this year. So again, we were seeing countries peeling away from the uh, the attempt to isolate Assad and to say, well, actually, that hasn't worked. You know, the reality on the ground, unfortunately, because a lot of people, I think, didn't want Assad to win mm. you know, the war against his own people. But the reality on the ground is that he did. And so you have to work with what you have. And I think that's what has really animated the Saudi and the UAE attempt to to really work with Assad because they see that as maybe more productive than, than not doing so. Mm. And again, there are countries like Qatar and Kuwait in the Gulf, which still don't want to work with Assad. It's not, there's no consensus, there's no unanimity. But certainly when a country like China does decides to do so, I think that does send a powerful signal that certainly I think people in the US will if they're paying attention, because again, their focus is elsewhere. I think they'll be looking to see how many other countries now follow suit. Mm. Dr. Alrickson, two more questions before letting you go. Now, let's talk about another nation, which is called Israel. Again, the news broke out that Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister of Israel, is expected to also visit China this year. Of course, that again, as we mentioned before, in June of this year, the Palestinian Authority, Abbas, visited China and also China offer again to be the mediator for Israeli and also the Palestinians. Now, we don't know what will happen when Benjamin Netanyahu visits China. But meanwhile, why do you think China today is so active to become the mediator become for almost impossible? What we say, it's not like a mission impossible. You know, again, on one hand, we understand U.S. has also been working so hard. You know, if we can trace all the way back, all the way back to the Clinton administration and all the way, all the way back to Bush administration, Obama, even Trump administration, try to solve the issue between Israeli and also the Palestinians. Either we have this two-state solution or we don't. But right now, China step up in this game to say, hey, listen, we can mediate and also we can delegate the two countries and the two authorities at the same time. Again, going back to the word reciprocity, what could we expect when we have the conversation, well, when we see the conversation between Benjamin and Yahoo and the Chinese leader, of course, when we talk about the Palestinian, I'm sorry, the Palestinians and Israelis, what do you think of that? Well, I think Netanyahu has so many problems in terms of trying to balance his international focus with keeping his domestic coalition mm. together. And members of his coalition, which are supporting his government, uh, do not want to make any concessions whatsoever to the Palestinians. And I think that's also what has been complicating his 
attempts to reach an agreement with the Saudis because I think that Netanyahu realizes that to have an agreement with Saudi Arabia or with other countries on this issue, he has to make concessions. But his key coalition partners would threaten to walk out and bring down his government if he did so. So it's a very tight balance that I'm not sure he fully can control in the sense of trying to keep everyone on the side. So I think it will be interesting to see if he does go to China, what develops. I think obviously the Chinese have become much more vocal about trying to step in in terms of political and diplomatic issues in the Middle East. And as you say, that has been a big shift uh, you know, for a long time. Uh, it was seen that China did not try to involve itself in political and diplomatic issues. And they were in some ways left to others. I and mean, obviously it's now 30 years this month since the Oslo Accords in September 1993, the agreement brokered by, like, well, I mean, certainly supported by the Clinton administration between mm. Israel and the Palestinians. That hasn't delivered in terms of the results that was hoped. And so it may be that it's time for a new approach. I mean, and certainly some trying to do something differently. And so that could be why Abbas was in China in late spring, early summer. And if Netanyahu goes, they could at least be trying to explore the parameters of a different way of going forward. Could also be that Netanyahu wants to signal to the US that actually mm. he has options too. And if you, the US, doesn't uh, support what I'm doing, we can go to China. And certainly I think that will be something that the US will be watching very carefully, just mm. because the US does see anything to do with China in terms of great power competition and strategic rivalry, which uh, does give room for maneuver to countries like Saudi Arabia or Israel to in a sense, play both sides and to sort of play them off against each other to see how much they can uh, try to get in terms of support for their own position. Mm. Well, Dr. Elrickson, I want to wrap up our conversation again. Since you mentioned Saudi Arabia, let's talk about this another piece of breaking news that recently Saudi Crown Prince went on this show to be interviewed. But meanwhile, he mentioned that every day, Saudi Arabia is getting closer to normalization with Israel. Now, again, if it happens, this could be another groundbreaking piece of news for the whole world. Because, again, we're looking at two major economic players in the Middle East. One is Saudi Arabia. Other one is Israel. Now, Dr. Al Rickson, your final thoughts is how much or how likely do you think is going to happen? Again, when Saudi Crown Prince said... This relationship is being normalized every day with Israel. And your final thoughts? Well, I like to use the term normalizing normalization. He's getting people used to the idea that this will happen. Mm. And so when it eventually does happen, it will not be a seismic shock to anyone. It will just be a, well, yes, we knew this was going to happen at some point. Uh, the UAE, for example, did the same thing in the 2010s for many years. The relationship between the UAE and Israel was becoming more and more open so that by the time they normalized in 2020, it was no big deal. And I think certainly for a domestic audience in Saudi Arabia, had this been announced out of the blue 15 years ago, there could have been a lot of shock and anger mm. potentially. Mm. But I just think that people are being normalized now uh, by the fact that Saudi Arabia and Israel are not sworn enemies, that they do have interests in common, that they are talking, they are engaging. And now the Crown Prince himself has said it, that's an incredibly powerful signal, I think. Mm. And so I think he's just preparing the ground for the eventual time, which we don't know. It may be next week, it may be next month, it may be next year, it may never happen. It may be years from now, but when it does happen, I think it will be such that people will just say, well, we knew it was going to happen, there's no, no big deal. So I think that's part of the strategy is preparing the ground and preparing just changing the mindset of people to to think of Israel not as an enemy, but as a as a country that shares some interests in terms of its uh, regional outlook, position, and objectives. Indeed, again, we are in the year of 2023, especially for China and also for the nation of Israel and Syria, Turkey, Iran. Every single player has multiple cards to play, but at the end of the day, it's crucial that we need to understand isolation never works, 
and only collaborative uh, relationship could produce better results. And again, we hope that Assad is going to deliver the promises that he made to the Chinese government. And also we're looking forward to see the further dialogues and cooperation between the two countries.